To understand the management of shock in an intensive care unit, we need to identify which type of shock it is to get a definitive approach, so, let's dive in and learn about the various types of shock and their causes. First, hypovolemic shock. This type of shock occurs when there is a significant loss of blood or fluid in the body. This can be caused by severe bleeding, dehydration, or excessive sweating. The decrease in blood volume leads to a decrease in blood pressure and inadequate blood flow to the body's organs and tissues. Next, cardiogenic shock. This type of shock occurs when the heart is unable to pump enough blood to the body's organs and tissues. This can be caused by a heart attack, heart failure, or other conditions that affect the heart's ability to function properly. Third, septic shock. This type of shock occurs when the body's immune system overreacts to an infection, leading to inflammation throughout the body. This inflammation can cause damage to the body's organs and tissues, leading to shock. Next, anaphylactic shock. This type of shock occurs when the body has an extreme allergic reaction to a substance, such as a medication or food. The immune system releases chemicals that cause blood vessels to dilate, leading to a decrease in blood pressure and inadequate blood flow to the body's organs and tissues. Lastly, neurogenic shock. This type of shock occurs when there is damage to the nervous system, such as a spinal cord injury or severe head trauma. The damage to the nervous system can cause blood vessels to dilate, leading to a decrease in blood pressure and inadequate blood flow to the body's organs and tissues. Now, let's learn in detail about each type of shock, their causes, and their pathomechanisms. First, hypovolemic shock. Hypovolemic shock is a life-threatening condition that occurs when there is a significant loss of blood volume or fluids in the body, leading to a decreased cardiac output and tissue perfusion. In this section, we will explore the underlying mechanisms that contribute to the development of hypovolemic shock. Hypovolemic shock can be caused by a variety of factors, such as trauma, severe bleeding, burns, vomiting, diarrhea, or excessive sweating. Regardless of the cause, the end result is a decrease in the circulating blood volume, which leads to a series of physiological changes that can ultimately result in tissue damage and organ failure. The initial response to hypovolemia is the activation of the sympathetic nervous system, which triggers the release of catecholamines such as epinephrine and norepinephrine. These hormones act on the heart and blood vessels, causing an increase in heart rate and vasoconstriction, respectively. The goal of these responses is to maintain blood pressure and perfusion to vital organs, such as the brain and heart. As hypovolemia worsens, the body's compensatory mechanisms become inadequate, and the blood pressure begins to decline. This can lead to a decrease in tissue perfusion, which can cause cellular hypoxia and metabolic acidosis. In an attempt to correct the acidosis, the body increases its respiratory rate, which can lead to hyperventilation and respiratory alkalosis. If left untreated, hypovolemic shock can progress to irreversible tissue damage and organ failure. The brain, heart, lungs, kidneys, and liver are particularly vulnerable to hypoperfusion, which can lead to ischemia, infarction, and ultimately, cell death. Treatment for hypovolemic shock involves restoring blood volume and improving tissue perfusion. This may involve the administration of intravenous fluids, blood transfusions, or medications that improve cardiac output or vasodilation. In severe cases, surgical intervention may be necessary to stop bleeding or repair damage to organs. We'll now talk about the pathophysiology of cardiogenic shock. Cardiogenic shock is a potentially fatal illness that develops when the heart cannot pump enough blood to meet the needs of the body. In this section, we will look at the underlying processes that lead to the development of cardiogenic shock. Cardiogenic shock can be caused by a number of factors, including a heart attack, heart failure, valvular heart disease, or arrhythmias. Whatever the cause, the end result is a decrease in cardiac output, which causes a cascade of physiological changes that can lead to tissue damage and organ failure. The initial response to reduced cardiac output is the activation of the sympathetic nervous system, which triggers the release of catecholamines such as epinephrine and norepinephrine. These hormones act on the heart and blood vessels, causing an increase in heart rate and vasoconstriction, respectively. The goal of these responses is to maintain blood pressure and perfusion to vital organs, such as the brain and heart. 
However, in cardiogenic shock, these compensatory mechanisms become inadequate, and the blood pressure begins to decline. This can lead to a decrease in tissue perfusion, which can cause cellular hypoxia and metabolic acidosis. In an attempt to correct the acidosis, the body increases its respiratory rate, which can lead to hyperventilation and respiratory alkalosis. As the condition worsens, the heart may become ischemic and contractility may decrease, leading to a further decline in cardiac output. This vicious cycle can ultimately result in multi-organ failure, particularly in organs with high oxygen demand such as the brain and kidneys. Treatment for cardiogenic shock involves improving cardiac output and tissue perfusion. This may involve the administration of medications such as inotropes or vasodilators to improve contractility and decrease afterload. In severe cases, mechanical circulatory support devices such as intraortic balloon pumps or ventricular assist devices may be necessary to support the failing heart. Additionally, treating the underlying cause of cardiogenic shock is crucial. For example, in the case of myocardial infarction, reperfusion therapy such as percutaneous coronary intervention or PCI, or thrombolytic therapy may be necessary to restore blood flow to the heart. Next, we will discuss the pathophysiology of septic shock. Septic shock is a life-threatening condition that occurs when the body's immune system overreacts to an infection, causing widespread inflammation and organ dysfunction. In this video, we will explore the underlying mechanisms that contribute to the development of septic shock. Septic shock begins with an infection, which can be caused by a variety of bacteria, viruses, or fungi. The immune system responds to the infection by releasing inflammatory mediators, such as cytokines and chemokines, to help fight off the invading pathogen. However, in septic shock, the immune response becomes dysregulated, and the inflammatory mediators can cause widespread damage to the body's tissues and organs. The vasculature becomes leaky, which can lead to hypovolemia and decreased tissue perfusion. As a result, the body begins to activate compensatory mechanisms to maintain blood pressure and tissue perfusion. The sympathetic nervous system is activated, causing vasoconstriction and an increase in heart rate. The renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system or RAAS is also activated, leading to increased fluid retention and vasoconstriction. However, these compensatory mechanisms can eventually become overwhelmed, and the blood pressure may begin to decline. This can lead to a decrease in tissue perfusion, which can cause cellular hypoxia and metabolic acidosis. In an attempt to correct the acidosis, the body increases its respiratory rate, which can lead to hyperventilation and respiratory alkalosis. As the condition worsens, organ dysfunction may occur, particularly in the lungs, kidneys, and liver. The immune response can also lead to the development of disseminated intravascular coagulation or DIC a condition in which blood clots form throughout the body, leading to further organ dysfunction and potential bleeding complications. Treatment for septic shock involves identifying and treating the underlying infection, as well as providing supportive care to maintain blood pressure and tissue perfusion. Antibiotics are often used to treat the infection, and fluid resuscitation may be necessary to maintain adequate blood pressure and tissue perfusion. Vasopressors, such as norepinephrine or dopamine, may be used to increase blood pressure and improve tissue perfusion. Additionally, organ support may be necessary, such as mechanical ventilation for respiratory failure, dialysis for kidney failure, or liver support for liver failure. In severe cases, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation ECMO, or other forms of mechanical circulatory support may be necessary to support the failing organs. Anaphylactic shock is a serious and potentially life-threatening allergic reaction that can occur when someone is exposed to an allergen. In this section we will discuss what happens in the body during an anaphylactic reaction and the pathophysiology of anaphylactic shock. First of all, what is anaphylactic shock? Anaphylactic shock is a severe form of an allergic reaction that occurs when the immune system overreacts to an allergen. This overreaction can cause the body to release large amounts of histamine and other inflammatory mediators, leading to a systemic inflammatory response. When a person is exposed to an allergen, such as food, medication, or an insect sting, the immune system recognizes it as a foreign substance and produces antibodies called immunoglobulin E or IgE to combat it. 
These Ig antibodies attach to mast cells and basophils, which are cells that release histamine and other inflammatory mediators when activated. Upon subsequent exposure to the same allergen, the allergen binds to the IgE antibodies on the mast cells and basophils, causing them to release their contents. This results in the release of histamine, leukotrienes, prostaglandins, and other inflammatory mediators into the bloodstream, causing widespread vasodilation, increased vascular permeability, and smooth muscle contraction. Histamine is a key mediator in anaphylaxis and can cause many of the symptoms associated with anaphylactic shock, including swelling of the face, lips, and tongue, difficulty breathing, hives, and low blood pressure. The release of these inflammatory mediators causes a systemic inflammatory response, leading to the symptoms of anaphylactic shock. The vasodilation and increased vascular permeability can cause a rapid drop in blood pressure, leading to hypotension and shock. In severe cases, this can result in organ failure and death. The treatment of anaphylactic shock involves the administration of epinephrine, which is a potent vasoconstrictor that can counteract the vasodilation and increase blood pressure. Antihistamines, corticosteroids, and bronchodilators may also be used to alleviate symptoms. Next, neurogenic shock. Neurogenic shock is a type of shock that occurs as a result of damage to the nervous system specifically the sympathetic nervous system. This system is responsible for controlling many vital functions in the body, such as heart rate, blood pressure, and body temperature. When the sympathetic nervous system is damaged, it can no longer regulate these functions, leading to a state of shock. This is because the body is no longer able to compensate for changes in blood pressure and heart rate, resulting in a drop in blood pressure and reduced blood flow to the organs. There are several causes of neurogenic shock, including spinal cord injury, brain injury, and certain medications such as anesthesia. Spinal cord injury is the most common cause of neurogenic shock and can occur as a result of trauma or disease. When the spinal cord is injured, it can no longer transmit signals from the brain to the rest of the body, including the sympathetic nervous system. This results in a loss of sympathetic tone and an inability to regulate blood pressure and heart rate. The effects of neurogenic shock on the body can be severe. Reduced blood flow to the organs can cause organ failure and can even be life-threatening if left untreated. Symptoms of neurogenic shock include low blood pressure, rapid heart rate, cold and clammy skin, and reduced urine output. The treatment of neurogenic shock depends on the underlying cause. In cases of spinal cord injury, the primary focus is on stabilizing the patient and preventing further damage to the spinal cord. This may involve immobilization of the patient and administration of medications to reduce inflammation and swelling. In addition, patients with neurogenic shock may require fluids and medications to support blood pressure and organ function. These may include intravenous fluids, vasopressors, and inotropes. In conclusion, shock is a life-threatening medical condition that requires immediate medical attention. There are several types of shock, each with its own unique pathomechanism. It is important to be aware of the different types of shock and their symptoms in order to recognize and treat them effectively. Remember, early recognition and intervention can mean the difference between life and death. If you suspect that you or someone you know is in shock, seek medical attention immediately. Thank you for watching and please stay safe and healthy.